Grace to you and peace from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus. Amen. <coughs> thy word, St. Pastor John, thy word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. Those words are from one of the Psalms. That God's word lights our way. It's a beautiful song and a great sentiment. But I got to tell you, there are times when we read passages like we're just read, and it seems, well, you know, sometimes in church you read the gospel lesson, at the end of it you say, the gospel of the Lord, right? It's supposed to be good news. But when you read a passage like that, sometimes it doesn't seem like such good news. The words that were just read are part of a larger piece, Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. It's that long sermon in chapter uh, starts in chapter 5 in the Gospel of Matthew. Starts with the Beatitudes, you know, blessed are the poor, blessed are the. And it goes on with the words that we have for today. Words that, quite frankly, um, they're scary. At least to me they are. <laughs> because it's easy on the one hand to say, okay, so I haven't murdered, haven't slept with someone I shouldn't have, haven't done this, and I'm, so I'm good. And Jesus steps right in the middle of that placid pond and causes waves and says, no, no, you don't get it. It's worse than that. And we're not, we're not used to thinking of Jesus this way. I mean, we're used to Jesus, the one who, who, to the woman caught in the act of adultery, says, who accuses you? They've all gone. Go and sin no more. It, it's like Jesus makes it easy on us. Just go and sin no more. Oh, okay, I'll go. Oh, oh. That again. But you come to a passage like this, and, and the one who we think is the one who gets rid of the law, even though he says he didn't do that, that's the way we think about him, right? He, he gets rid of that burden for us, seems to come with heavier handcuffs and leg irons and say it's worse than you thought. So, what do you do with a passage? There's two kind of general ways that people go. On the one hand, sort of a reinforcement of, of you have to live your life according to all kinds of laws and rules. The things that you do and you don't do if you're going to stay on God's good side. So n not only do you not murder, do you not commit adultery, do you, not, you, know, you avoid the, the don'ts of the Ten Commandments, but there's all kinds of other things that you shouldn't do as well. In, in Judaism, in Jesus' day, uh, there were something over 600 of those laws of things that you just didn't do, or you had to do at the right time, uh, in, in order to be right before God. It's like everything in life, you had to be careful that you were doing the right way and not doing the wrong thing so that you could be righteous before God. In our own day, it takes different forms. Uh, there are different styles of Christianity, if you will, uh, uh, that, that have different things that you should or shouldn't do. In the early 19th, or in the early 20th century, get my century straight. In the early 20th century, if you were a Lutheran, you were not to purchase insurance because that wasn't trusting God. And then they changed their mind on that because they created uh, the Aid Association for Lutherans which sold insurance. <laughs> and you're familiar with other things. You're not supposed to smoke in some, uh, some se segments of Christianity. You're not supposed to drink. You're not supposed to dance. You're not supposed to do whatever. And it kind of sounds like, well, that's what Jesus is about. He passes like it was just read. You just you lock everybody up and, and make sure that they don't do the wrong things so that they'll then be righteous. But the problem is once you've locked everybody up like that, all you've done is create ways for them to make even more of a mess out of their life of faith, because that's not what the law is for. Paul, a little later on in the New Testament, talks about what the law is for. He says, the law is given to increase sin. Run the value one more time. The law was given to increase sin. He said, I wouldn't have known I wasn't supposed to covet, except the law says don't covet. So on the other hand, what do you do with a passage like this? Well, a lot of times, but it goes like this. Well, you can't do any of that. It's impossible for us to live that way. So don't even worry about trying that. Just, just believe in Jesus and know that it's all forgiven. Except that is not what he's saying. At all. Which is why I find passages like this so frightening. This is Jesus' main sermon in the Gospel according to St. Matthew. 
It shows up in a slightly different form in the Gospel of Luke. That's two Gospels, same sermon. I think maybe he's trying to make a point. But what is the point? We human beings would like to think that if we just sort of go along with the good things about our society, we sort of stay in line, that that's what God expects from us, and it's all going to be okay. As long as we don't sort of color outside the lines too badly, we'll be fine. We'll just go along with the culture and, and its good parts. You know, we, we won't, we recognize there are things about our culture and the society we live in that are just, <clears throat> go there. So we won't do that, but as long as we kind of stay on the right side of the line, stay on our lane, don't color outside the line too badly, that's what God wants. But what Jesus is saying here is it's something completely different. He te preaches this sermon in which he locks everybody up, if you will, under this law and says, if you're going to try to follow some path of your own creation, you're going to try to turn these laws from God into a path to get to him, here's how far you have to go. So you should feel free to do that. Just go ahead and try it. Because what you'll find is, though you haven't murdered anyone, you've been angry enough to do it, and the only difference is you're too chicken to have done it. And you'll find somebody that you lust after, and the only reason you won't have committed adultery is because you're too chicken to have done it. And how does that credit to you? It doesn't at all. So Jesus, in this sermon, points to an utterly different way of life, one made possible only by a change of heart, which is possible only by faith in something other than yourself, your own path, or the path of your culture and society. A path that lies in a very different place, on a road, a small road, that runs from the city of Jerusalem to a hill outside. The only way of life, says Jesus, the word of God in flesh, the light of wisdom in flesh, the only way of life is the way that lies through the cross, through the death of all of your desires to make yourself righteous before God, to the death of all of your desires to just look better than everyone else. To the death of everything that would keep you from following fully in an utterly different way. The way of Jesus. We teach children, I'm sure you were taught, you went to Sunday school, that we're supposed to follow what Jesus says and do what Jesus does. And we grow up and we find that difficult. So sometimes we make allowances for ourselves. And then words like ones for this morning come back. And God takes the allowance away. He says, there's only one way. There's one way to live. There's one way that follows in the light of God. There's one way that actually helps you to leave aside your anger and your base passions. The way of trusting in and of following Jesus who by the power of the Spirit, as you live in His way, as you put your feet on that unfamiliar path that leads to the cross in order to virtually lead to resurrection, that leads to something new. It is beyond difficult. It is impossible for us to live up to the standard of this sermon. And yet Jesus preaches this sermon which is a call of faith in Him. A call to put Him at the center of your being. Make His wisdom the way of your mind. Make His path the way of your feet. Let His light light your way. This is the way of faith. It's a way of death of your old sinful nature. But it leads to resurrection in Christ, and not just at the end. 
it leads to the possibility of finally being able to forgive those people that you need to forgive. And I speak this not as somebody who's figured that all out. Because I can think of a couple people that when I think of them, my blood pressure still goes up. And yet, yet, because of faith, because I believe that Jesus is true, because I believe that in his death on the cross, he took away the power of that sin in me to destroy relationship, to destroy the possibility of forgiving someone else, and that in his resurrection from the dead, there becomes hope still for me. I still try. Sometimes against what might be my better judgment. I try. Because faith calls me to do exactly that. And in the way of faith is freedom and life. It's in him alone. In the name of Jesus, the word, the light of me,